Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to get started because I think I, I added more slides since the last time I gave this talk, which was yesterday. Uh, so um, be prepared. <clears throat> uh, I was, I'm was. i going to start off by saying that uh, when uh, Professor Sibyl asked me to um, talk on this topic, I was thrilled because uh, the issue of teamwork and communication is uh, paramount to, to achieving better care. Um, when we think that we could just set something in place and not have teamwork or not have that communication and just kind of put a protocol into place and, and expect that to work and sustainably work, uh, it doesn't. And so, and a foundation of all this is the teamwork and communication. Now, whenever people hear that, who haven't tried to do it, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we know. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. And they just kind of skip over that. But if any of you, and I'm sure all of you, have done projects where you've tried to get something uh, integrated, tried to implement something, tried to do something so it gets better, and, and, and it's going to involve a number of people, a number of disciplines, a number of kind of areas within uh, either the operating room before or after the operating room, that if that communication and that teamwork isn't there, it won't fly. You can do it for maybe a couple days, a week, maybe a month, uh, but then it usually won't last. So talking on this is, is, really, um, is, is really important, and so I'm glad to speak to it. <clears throat> so let me get started here. Okay, we live, I'm going to start here, we live in a, a millennial environment, and I was talking about this yesterday, but I thought I'd put it onto a slide because this is, I think, a key point. So we live in a millennial environment, and so, although you know we might not be in the millennial generation, we are getting uh, subsumed by being in the millennial environment. And so what does that mean? So it means, number one, it's we have a shorter attention span. And this is actually proven in studies where the attention span of everyone these days is shorter and shorter. It used to be that they do these studies where they would focus somebody on something and then try to distract them and how easily they get distracted. And it's decreased by 30% in the last, uh, I think now it's about six or seven years, to the point that um, grade schoolers have the attention span that's equivalent to a goldfish, which is not good. And so our attention span is, is getting slow or, or is getting lower and lower. And so we have to, a lot of times when we're working with a team and we're working uh, with communicating, we have to communicate, we have to get to the point. Multitasking. Uh, this boy here is multitasking. He's riding his skateboard. He's on his phone probably texting his mom and ordering a cappuccino from Starbucks uh, he, and, and changing his bank account. So we are in this day and age of multitasking. And in the operating room or in the hospital, we are trying to multitask and we're trying to talk to people and they're trying to multitask. It's a, it's a way of life. Most studies have shown that uh, we cannot multi, even though we think we can multitask well, we can't but we still do. <clears throat> out of the box, we draw on a lot of material. So we have at our fingertips a lot, a lot, a lot of information. We can go to the internet and collect so much more information than we could before. We don't have to, you know, libraries and bookstores are going extinct because nobody goes to them anymore. We can go onto the internet and, and as this uh, thing says here, um, you know, a person in the mid ages, their entire life information that they would gain, we gain in one day. So we have a lot of information at our fingertips. So we have shorter attention span, we do a lot of things all at once, and we have a lot of information at, um, uh, uh, at our fingertips. <clears throat> There's also a different language. Our language is changing. So people are using these types of things as great or oh my gosh, and then that one. Um, <clears throat> and, and so a lot of things are changing. I was interviewing a, uh, a medical student for our training program and he texted me a thank you, and he said that I, I work at UCLA, and he says, I think UCLA is great. And first of all, he texted. Most people will type something. <laughs> if not, they'll handwrite it and send it through the regular mail. But this uh, student uh, texted and said, it, I think this is, it's great. He, he ended up not coming to UCLA. <clears throat> um, the great thing is that in this generation, that especially the millennial generation itself, is that they are dedicated. They want to make a difference. It's not a secret, and I'm sure here also that th that generation wants to do global work. They want to, at least within surgery, every one of our trainees who's in that situ in, in that generation, they want to do global surgery and go help the w help the world. It is great. 
It is absolutely great. The, 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 the problem is, is that that generation and, and us being in this kind of environment is that we lack experience. With so much information that we could look on Wikipedia or Google something, and we could get all this stuff on our computer screen or on our smartphone or on our tablet, we see what the words are, but we lack the experience. We lack, we don't get feedback. We don't have those personal observations. And so the best way to do that, and, um, and you'll hear this later on, is through story. Stories are key. Stories sharing of quality improvement, how this happens at our hospital, how we got a meeting together with the surgeons and anesthesia and nursing and pharmacy, what day of the week did we do it and what time of the day did we do it? Even something like that, what story that is of how that's achieved because then that tells us it's, it's, it's feasible and, it's, and we can do it uh, and not just reinventing the wheel. So that's very important in terms of all this, in terms of the millennial environment, sharing stories and communicating with the team these things is going to be very important. <clears throat> so uh, as Professor Civil said, I work at the American College of Surgeons, the ACS, and I work in, the, in this division of all of their quality improvement programs. And so there's a number of programs, and from these programs I'm going to share with you some observations and some stories, but just to let you know what kind of programs there are, we have a cancer program called the Commission on Cancer or the COC. This is an accreditation program that has a data registry that can collects all the data uh, for cancer patients. Uh, and they might have gone under surgery, had radiation, had chemotherapy, had all three, had more stuff. Um, so it's a registry that does that, and it also is an accreditation program. So it, it, it goes to visits, it visits the hospitals or facilities every three years to ensure that they're giving good cancer care with their data, that they have the appropriate you know, committees, that they have the appropriate conferences to, to take care of the patients and you know, have multidisciplinary conferences and review conferences and, and things like that. So that's the commission. It's 1,500 hospitals. 80% of the cancer that occurs in the United States occurs in these hospitals, in these 1,500 hospitals. In the United States, we have about 5,000 hospitals. So this is the, this is the 1,500 that take care of cancer patients. We have a trauma program called the Trauma Quality Improvement Program that is also has a data registry. So a lot of you'll see a, a familiar theme that everything is going to try to be very data driven. If we try to do improvement or we try to do evaluation without data, then it's usually not accurate. And usually people think that they're much better than they are. And so uh, everyone is above the mean. In fact, everyone is in the 90th percentile. But with data, we know that that's not true. And so this program also has a registry, and it's, it's all the trauma programs in the US where there's, we have level one, two, three, four trauma centers. They get accredited, and they get verified that they're doing what they say they're doing and with the data and, and with you know, all of the, all the processes and protocols. And so that occurs in the United States. We have a bariatric program. And I won't go belabor the point, but we, there's a pediatric surgery program. This is something also that um, we're starting new uh, just this year because a lot, there's a lot of variation in pediatric surgery in the United States. Uh, from the data, and, and so we're putting a, a program in place to help decrease that variability uh, and disparity in cares uh, in pediatric surgery. And the same thing for geriatric surgery, which is just under uh, going, uh, just getting developed right now. The program that uh, that is not a accreditation program, but just a a, uh, a registry itself, is is this one called NISQIP. The National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. There are 600 hospitals that participate in this, and this is a registry alone, and it's very broad. So it's all kinds of specialties except for cardiac surgery. It's all the other specialties in it where data are collected and fed back to the hospitals in a risk-adjusted outcomes way. So a hospital knows its mortality rate, its surgical infection rate, its VTE rate, its pneumonia rate, all of these things, its length of stay, and it's benchmarked against these other 600 hospitals. Most of the hospitals that participate in this are the hospitals that, that, that do inpatient care, that might have a, a seemingly more complex uh, cases in that. And so as an example, if, if folks are from the operating room here, it's, it, they're not um, you know, skin lump lipoma removals. The hospital that does a lot of those, they probably wouldn't be in this program. The hospital that does colon operations or pancreas or liver or esophagus or um, ventral hernia repairs or things like that, emergency surgeries, acute care surgery, uh, those, are the, those are these types of hospitals. And the, and the data are fed back and, the, and it, it's benchmarked. So a hospital knows, is it one of the better hospitals? Is it one of the worst hospitals? Is it in the middle? 
And this report, and, and there's, I won't go into the, the details of it, but the, the data are collected by a trained data collector that the, not the hospital doesn't train, but the American College of Surgeons trains and tests every year. There's a, there's a certification exam that the data collector, and it's mostly uh, nurses uh, who collect the data, uh, and, and they have to pass this test before they can collect for this program. So the data are very, very accurate. And what that means is that the then, when the data are fed back, because it's so accurate, then, the da then usually the hospitals and the surgeons and the anesthesiologists and the nurses at that hospital will act on it because they believe it. Well, one of the lessons we've learned is that if you have data that nobody believes, if it's, you know, in the U.S. we use claims data a lot for, for getting paid, the administrative data, ICD, international classification data. And if that's used, most of the clinicians do not believe that that data for quality. And so we can't get actionable um, movement if we use poor data. Uh, so that's one of the, the one of the hallmarks of this program. And I, I suspect in your hospital, if you have good data, people will act on it. If you have data that people do not believe, people will not act on it. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some observations, and I'll go through until it's time to stop, and then I'll stop. But observation one, <clears throat> consider and embrace equifinality. <laughs> So equifinality means that there can be more, one, more than one solution to a problem. And so we've learned this because a lot of the things that we look at in terms of outcomes are multifactorial. And the big issue that we are trying to, we've been dealing with for ever since the beginning of, of the, the NISQIP program 10 years ago is infection. And infection is so multifactorial in terms of the fixes uh, we have found that some hospitals will fix one thing and, and lower their infection rate. Another hospital will fix an, a different thing and lower its infection rate. And that's the whole, that's the idea of equifinality, is that, is that there's more than one way to do it, and, and a lot of times we have to discover what it is. So um, yesterday I just kind of set put this slide out, and I think that I didn't explain it well enough. So I'm going to go into now some more of the details so you will – Get, uh, get why we think like this. <clears throat> so we started a project. It was a two-year project. It was uh, over a million dollars that was put into this because it was, it was so sta staff heavy. And it was, the idea was to reduce colorectal surgical site infections. So col colon surgery, colectomies, are done in probably 75% of hospitals in the United States, almost 3,500, 3,700 of the 5,000 uh, or so hospitals in the United States perform colon resections. So that was one reason. It's, it's common. It's not just the big hospitals. It's not just the academic teaching hospitals. It's basically all hospitals. It's also a procedure that has a very identifiable and, and measurable complication rate. The complication rate of, of a colon operation using the NISQIP uh, way of collecting data is about 25 percent. So one in four people undergoing a colon operation have a have a, an event or an occurrence that occurs within 30 days, whether it's a readmission, an, a, a UTI, urinary tract infection, an S, a surgical site infection, a pneumonia, an aspiration, or, or something like that. One in four patients in the United States have that when we follow them very um, uh, rigorously for 30 days. And so when somebody came to the college and said, all right, we want to do a project in surgery, what is, a, what is a topic? We said, all right, well, colon surgery and surgical site infections. The surgical site infection rate, so all complications is about 25%. The surgical site infection rate occurrence is about 15%, SSIs. And as we know, SSIs are in three layers. There's at the skin layer, there's the deep layer at the fascia, and then there's the intra-abdominal layer, which are basically the leaks when you put it together and it leaks. And so all three of those together, it's about 15%. And so this study got together eight very well-known hospitals that, a high, that had a higher than they wanted uh, surgical site infection rate. And you might not have heard of these, um, all of these hospitals, but they are some of the best hospitals in, in the country. So the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is one of the largest and most uh, respected hospitals in the country. The Cleveland Clinic is, is very similar to the Mayo Clinic, and they also do 
uh, 1,500, 2,000 colon operations a year. So they do a lot of it. And a lot of times they, they're very much a tertiary quaternary referral center. People have a problem th with their colon. They a lot of times will go to the Cleveland Clinic. Other academic teaching hospitals, the uh, Northwestern in Chicago, Stanford Hospital in uh, Palo Alto in, in Northern California. So these are very well-known hospitals. They had a higher rate than they wanted when we fed back the data using NISQIP. Their, their rate was higher than, was too high for what their patients should have been having. And so they, we got all these hospitals together and started working with them. And we did this using a technique of quality improvement, uh, uh, Six Sigma. Does anyone use Six Sigma here? Heard of it? And in any case, Six Sigma is a very analytic, very data heavy um, way of looking at things. You basically collect a lot of data and then they use these, they have it based on like the karate belts. They have black belts and yellow belts and green belts. So we had all these belts running around collecting data and just kind of analyzing it. And, and um, because they felt the leader of this uh, 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 was the head of our, of our accreditation, hospital accreditation program in the United States, the Joint Commission. And, and he said that we need to do this with science. Um, so they did it with Six Sigma. And uh, so they collected all this data. And, uh, and this person who is leading the Joint Commission, his name is, is, is um, Mark Chasson. He's an ER doc, emergency department doctor, very well trained in health services research, clinical research has a master's degree in it, has, has published very, very important papers in, in the United States for it. And he said, and, and he asked, is there an it factor? Because if there's an it factor for, for, for alleviating, preventing, um, stopping infections in colon surgery, we will find it. He was very sure of that. And as a colon surgeon, I'm like, you know, I've read the literature a lot. I'm a professor of surgery. I teach this stuff. I do it. I have complications. I don't know of anyone who's ever thought of discovering an it factor. But he, not being a surgeon, not, you know, he thought we, he'd find an it factor. Well, let me cut to the end. <clears throat> All the hospitals got better. So it's P O O O O something. They, they improved. So the infection rate went down. So you know that that happened. But, what we did during it is that we looked at all the different hospitals, and then we looked at for variables that correlated with surgical site infections. So what, is, what happened at your hospital? What correlated with the infection rate? And what we found is that when we looked at all of these things, and this is, this is where all those belts came in handy, because they started collecting all of these, um, this data on patient characteristics and surgical procedure, and then marking off which hospital it was a factor of. And you can see that there is no one thing where it was a factor in every hospital. And so even if we go to the, and this goes on, there are over 200 of these factors, but uh, I, I couldn't make it so many slides, but the uh, antibiotic issues here and preoperative and intraoperative processes here, there's no one thing that is a factor. If you can see A, B, C, D are the different hospitals, there's no one factor that is a factor in every single hospital. It was something different. And so what we actually found was that each hospital had different factors associated with this infection rate. So all the hospitals got better. Each of them had something different. And so the consequence of that is that each hospital had a different solution and I'll tell you they had a different rate for decreasing its infection so what happened was that very within we started the project and within three months the Mayo Clinic identified what they tried first their infection rate came down and what they tried was uh, a closing tray so you may all use a closing tray you might not but this is what they decided that this is what their problem was that uh, they'll do the colon operation and they're about to close the, close the fascia and they, they, instead of just using the instruments that they use to touch the bowel and touch the poop and touch everything else, they put those instruments away. They open up a new set of clean, and st clean sterile instruments. They had their surgeon and everyone around the table change their gown and change their gloves and then they closed. They did that and their infection rate went down. They were, I, I kind of think that they were very lucky to the first thing that they tried improved it, uh, but th they, that's what they did. <clears throat> the Cleveland Clinic, which I, I always use Cleveland Clinic as the, as the example because the two clinics are very similar. They're very large. They're very tertiary, quaternary. They're very well respected. They're always in the top five hospitals lists of quality hospitals in the U.S., both these hospitals. Um, <clears throat> 
So what they did is after three months, their rate was still high. After six months, they're trying, rate's still high. After 12 months, at a year's point, their rate was still high. And it's not like they weren't doing anything. They were trying all these things. They were going through the PDCAs, the Plan, Do, Check, uh, Study, Act cycles. They were doing all those things. They kept on going through, going through, going through. Still high, still high. At uh, 15 months, still high. And they were kind of getting frustrated as we were we, like, what the heck are you guys doing? Um, so we even took a field trip to the Mayo Clinic. And so the, all the, the, the colon surgeons and the quality people from Cleveland, we all went up to Minnesota and went to the Mayo Clinic to visit them and watch them. Um, and it was great. It was really, it was a cool place. They, had their, they, they do things their way. But the, after that field trip there for two days, the Cleveland people said, oh, that's great, but we, can, we do things way differently. We, we have a different throughput. We have different people doing different things. Our operating room doesn't work that way. We don't have a holding room here. We don't have to do this. And so they just said, well, it was great for what they did, but we, it, is not, it is not implementable what they do into what we're doing. And it kind of fits with what we do when we visit hospitals and all these other programs is that a lot of ho most hospitals are individualized in what they do. Uh, not just the culture, which is individualized, but a lot of the processes and the protocols and, the, and who does what are different. And so one of the things that we're learning from this is the equifinality. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and it has to be individualized to your hospital, and you have to make, uh, you have to find the answer for your hospital. So anyway, it took them 21 months until they fixed it. And it was, they fixed I, they fixed so many things. They had tried so many things. So who knows, maybe it was a combination of things. But finally, when they did something with their antibiotics and their dosing and, and whatnot, the, um, that's what seemed to help them uh, decrease their rate at 21 months versus three months for the Mayo Clinic. So each hospital had a different solution and different rate. And if you just look at this diagram, you can see that there's a lot of different hospitals. And you know, in this room, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of different hospitals. All hospitals were able to reach their goal of achieving improvement. They all improved, as I showed you on one of those slides. But the key thing is that there were different solutions in, in different paths and different timings. And so th this was a great lesson for us because it, with a lot of data collection and a lot of analysis, we saw this. Now, there are some things, I will say, that are probably easier to fix and some things that are harder to fix. And if you look at something and you say that, all right, this thing is multi-factor, there's a lot of factors that are gonna play into this. That's gonna be something that's harder to fix, but, and the more factors there are, the more solutions there probably are. Uh, some things are a lot more straightforward, like CLABSI, uh, central line bloodstream infections. Um, a lot of folks have just kind of gone with a bundle that when those, are, those lines are inserted and their rates of CLABSI infections have gone down using the whole drape, sterile technique, suturing it in sterilely, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so looking at the, the whole problem overall uh, of when we're going to try to tackle something, recognizing, uh, you know, taking a step back and recognizing, is this a very complex multifactorial thing or is this a, a kind of a, a, a simpler, more simple uh, thing in terms of, of the fix. That's very important to recognize. So in any case, that's the equifinality. For this thing, uh, there was no it factor. <clears throat> we know many roads lead to Rome. <clears throat> okay, so observation two. So some took lo longer to incorporate evidence-based standardized practice. Now, what does this mean? Well, we all go through evidence-based practice and we all wanna, ch you know, we all say, well, what's the evidence for doing this? What's the evidence for doing that? And a lot of times we say, all right, there's some evidence, but there's not as much evidence as we would like, but we'll just take the best evidence there is. Now, when we do evidence-based practice, or when we just practice and we are trying to take care of patients, we have to use what we have, and we have to do the best that we can. And so if we have evidence-based practice, we want to look at the best research evidence available. Yes, we'll take everything that's available. Often that's not enough, but we just take whatever's available. Then we have to marry it to clinical expertise. So if there's a, uh, an anesthesiologist who has done 300 of these kind of whatevers or a surgeon or a nurse who's kind of been in this case for, you know, over and over and over and over again, we have to take their clinical expertise, marry it to what's uh, published in the literature and put those two things together. And then we have to marry that also, and some people think this is, the most important thing with the patient's values and preferences of what the patient wants. Putting all those together, that's how we're going to take care of patients, and that's how we should decide to do things. Now, the key part about quality is decreasing variation. 
and that is standardizing. So we take all, like for example, three surgeons, uh, we have six colorectal surgeons uh, at UCLA, and so we're, we did things traditionally very differently. We were all different, you know, from the way we hand our instrument trays, how we took care of patients before the operation, and what evaluation we did then, what, how we take care of them afterwards, when we fed them, when we ambulate them, when we, what pain meds we used, when we discharged them, what was our protocol for following them up, and all that kind of stuff. And then, and, but uh, we worked for the better part of two years to make everything together. And this really helped because, and, and we didn't do this out of the goodness of our hearts. Our, our, the, our bosses said that your, your rates of, of actually readmission were too high. And like, well, why are they too high? Well, I tell, I, you know, with my patients, I have my physician assistant calling them. Another surgeon says, oh, I don't call them. If they have a problem, they call me. And so, and then, and then there's just, we had all these different ways of doing things. So the better part of two years, we, we had, had worked on trying to get standardized. And, and to be honest with you, we should have done it the right way and just done it because it's the right thing to do. When we find hospitals, when we see hospitals, whether it's trauma or bariatric or cancer or whatever, when they do things well, it's, sta it's mostly standardized. They know how, what's going to happen. And when it's standardized, the surgeon knows what's happening, the anesthesiologist knows, nursing knows what's happening, you know, the people in the clinic know what's happening, the people at discharge know. When it's standardized, people know what to expect. And so that, that's kind of the communication right there is that they know what's going to happen instead of having that opportunity for miscommunication because I do things just differently than this doctor, than that doctor, than that doctor. That's just a setup for, for errors. And so standardizing is very important. And, you know, when we did this, after we implemented all these things and, and, and got everything ready, our rates went down, our readmission rates went down um, uh, precipitously, and we were um, – it was it was amazing to see that, and it, it was stayed low uh, uh, after that. Uh, if anyone here is uh, uh, is going to try to standardize something, and if you haven't already, the ERAS program is great. It's called Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. If you just Google it, um, there is a ERAS society that's out of um, Northern Europe uh, that that has put together all the literature on enhanced recovery after surgery. They started in colon surgery, but now they're on to gastric and hepatic and a lot of the uh, gynecology, a lot of the abdominal surgeries where ileus is a problem and length of stay is a, is a problem because of that. And so they put together, uh, there's about 12 processes that, are, that can be standardized, how you um, the the pre-op evaluation of the patient using pain uh, preemptive analgesia, uh, ambulation, feeding the patient, all those things. There's a pre-op oh, patient education is a huge thing. Letting the patient know that you're leaving on day four, uh, and having that in their head. Um, so this is a great thing, and and this is just a, a graph to remind me to tell you that um, this is a systematic review of a number of studies that have shown that when you put these protocols into place, no matter how good you think you are, there's a reduction in length of stay. Now that's not the best outcome measure to use all the time because you can be kicking the patient out and they're just going to come back. But this is overall is shown with the enhanced recovery after surgery and that standardization. Patients, um, there's less resource use, so patients stay less. There's less complications, so actually the complication rates go down, and the readmission rates have not increased. So it's not like you're kicking them out sooner and then they just come right back. So this enhanced recovery is just a, is just a great example of standardization. Observation at three is this, is that what we never get told when we're told to standardize is that more than just standardization is needed. And if you've ever heard of, um, if you want to read more about this or, or hear more about this, write down the name Brent James. Brent James is a surgeon by training, uh, but he doesn't do surgery anymore. He does quality, and he's at the, in Utah uh, at the Intermountain Health uh, System. And what he does is that he has his, he does, he gets his, exam, for example, he gets his surgeons together to standardize something. Uh, but he only does it for a certain amount of time, and then at, at some point, they will review their standardization and change something because usually the standardization that occurs is not is not absolutely correct and so there's some things that always need to be tweaked but they standardize to kind of get a flavor of it and like all right this part of the protocol works this part of the protocol doesn't work this part of the protocol works so this part that doesn't work we're going to tweak it and then standardize to something different and so that's basically what this is it's that 
between these levels, the, between standardization, be, between these protocol things, there are things in between where changes occurred. And so when we looked at the hospitals that really do well with these protocols, and we saw how they continue to do well and even get better, um, we asked them what happens, but what's happening here at these times when you're actually even getting better or changing? And they said, we tried something new, we changed something, we innovated. We invented something. They were idea people, and they're, they're trying to get things together. Now, this is much better than these hospitals that kind of just, like, didn't standardize, and they just kind of were haphazard and chaotic in what they're doing, and that's a lot of hospitals that we visit. They don't have any systematic way of str strategizing, of planning, and standardizing anything. They just kind of go along, and the five or six colon surgeons did whatever they did, and it was just whatever. And... If you look at the delta between just whatever hospitals and hospitals that systematically try to improve by standardizing and, and, and innovating, this is the continuous quality improvement. Quality improvement is a journey. It's not a destination. And so it, we always have to be continually doing this. And, and, uh, and at the foundation of it, like I said in the beginning, is teamwork and, and communication. So if we ask these hospitals, what, what do they do? How do they know to stop standardizing and to change things? And Brent James says, all right, we're going to do it at, you know, in January. Every January we're going to do this. So he is very time-based. But a lot of the hospitals that we visited said it's based on data. When we have data that we believe, that we trust, and it comes back and tells us we're kind of slipping, then we, start, then we know we have to start changing something and relook at uh, what we're doing. And so this is the graph we give back in the NISQIP program where these hospitals are below one, so their rates are less than expected, so they're good. But when they, you know, when they look at subsequent reports in six months or in a year or a year and a half and their results start to slip, that's a very good indicator that they need to get better. So data, we need to be very data-driven. We need to get data back, whether it's you know, the briefing, concordance rate, compliance rate, or it's our infection rate, or it's our readmission rate. As soon as those things start slipping, and we're not happy with those, is when we need to start looking again at the protocols that we have and re-examine those types of things. <clears throat> so the fourth thing is, the fourth observation is communication and teamwork, our culture, is routinely associated with sustained quality and safety improvement. It's hard to have really sustained quality safety improvement without culture. And whenever we see places that have good quality, they tend to have the appropriate culture for that. And so there's this definition of culture, which I won't read to you, and you don't even have to write it down. Because this is the thing, it's the easier way to, to think about it. It's the way things get done around here. There's a haphazard, chaotic way where I just do it my way, and she does it her way, and he does it his way. Um, that's a culture. Uh, but regardless, culture is the most difficult thing to change. Uh, people say it takes five years. There's a very good hospital in the United States called Virginia Mason. They are in Seattle, and they are known as the Toyota Hospital because they believe in the Toyota Lean methodology. In fact, they send a lot of their surgeons and leadership to, to the Toyota Hospital in Japan to watch the standardization of things. And so I just visited them. I visited them seven years after they instituted the, um, their Toyota methodology, and they said, we have great culture. I'm like and and we know everything right now. And then I just actually visited them last year. It was 13 years after the institute, and they said, "Oh, at seven years, we didn't know what we we're doing." It actually takes 13 years. Um, so who knows how long it takes? But it is something that needs to be worked on. And again, this is a journey as well, improving culture. So I want to share a story with you um, about uh, improvement and culture to kind of solidify this this kind of uh, this this issue. So there is a hospital that, um, let me see if, I have, oh yeah. So again, this is that Caterpillar graph that we showed you. These are the good hospitals. These are the hospitals that are doing better than expected. Everyone in gray is doing as expected because their, actually their confidence interval, if you're statistically minded, their confidence interval here crosses one. So they're as, do, doing as expected. And these hospitals in red are doing worse than expected. So for the patients and for the operations they do, their complication rate is higher than expected. The hospital we're working with that, that this story is about and that we decided to work with is this hospital. It's the second to worst hospital in, in the whole program. They, um, 
Uh, and it was, again, for complications, uh, complications after colon operation. <coughs> they came to us and said, we have a lot of infections. I'm like, no, duh. I mean, we can see that. Um, but if we looked at numbers, this hospital had amongst the highest colon surgery infection rates at 27%. If you remember, um, the, the average, the mean uh, infection rate for colon operations across this program, following it for 30 days very rigorously, is 15%. So they almost had to double the rate of infections. This is a hospital that was a ap academic medical center. They did, I think, six or 700 colon operations a year. They are usually not just in the top five, they're usually one of the top two hospitals in the country every year. And, um, uh, and they had this problem. And they didn't know it. Well, what's really, uh, what's, uh, what's also uh, instructive is that they didn't know it until they started getting the data on themselves. Without data, they're just, you know, they're so famous and well known, like, we have to be good. Uh, we don't need data. We are good. Um, but when they started measuring it and they saw that it was 27% and like, oh, that's a fluke. Try it. Just wait. Still, it was still, it didn't change. And so they, they really wanted to work on it. So what, they, what did they do? They got a team together. And it's important that this team was very multidisciplinary. And so they had, um, they had people in the operating room, the techs. They had anesthesia. They had surgery. They had the uh, lead uh, uh, nurse in the operating room and the OR manager. They had a data manager. They had a coach from the hospital who was the quality improvement person. And then they had a, uh, a, a uh a representative or a somebody from the 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 um, senior management or C-suite, <coughs> where they were the senior director of quality of the whole place, and so they thought it was very important because if they're going to try to make changes, they need to have buy-in from the institution. Because doing it without buying in from the institution is it's an unfunded mandate. You have to do it on nights and weekends, and there's no support, and and it just usually doesn't go well. And so they put this. They intelligently put this whole team together. And so what they did next was that they set regular meetings for the team, for that team and the staff in those areas. So the nurses from the operating room, from post-operative care, from the clinic, they had the surgeons there, they had anesthesia there, they had all the folks, pharmacy, uh, and, and they started having these discussions. And what they really did was they empowered the frontline uh, frontline providers to really think about to brainstorm and identify what to work on. They didn't. It wasn't the surgeon or the head quality person that said, "I, you know what? If I look in the literature, the usual problem is X, Y, Z." Um, they talked to the frontline people, and the frontline people came up with certain things that they said, "Well, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem right. Let's work on this. Let's work on this." And and so. The, the, the four things that they identified were these. And these are not, it's not like this, so don't write these things down like this is the bundle to fix. This is what they decided to fix at this hospital. And so they wanted to standardize the skin prep. Some were using, uh, uh, um, um, they were just, they had, I think, three or four different ways to prep the patient. And uh, because of the surgeons did it three or four different ways. And so they decided to standardize that. They had antibiotic compliance and dosing problems. There, um, they used gentamicin, and when you load gentamicin, it's a much higher dose than what any of us really want to give because we're always afraid of the of the renal effects and the in the in the hearing effects. Um, so, but they were underdosing, and the pharmacist said, "You guys might as well just be." squirting it on the floor. That does us just as good So um, for the amount that you're giving. So they had to t change that. They also did what the Mayo Clinic did. They had the instrument tray and changing gloves before closing. And then anesthesia came up with this thing of normothermia. Um, in, in the United States, a performance measure is that we're, we do things for normothermia. So if we turn on the heater or if we turn on the fluids to, that are warmed, we get credit for that. But it doesn't mean that the patient becomes normothermic. We just done. We've just done stuff. And so the anesthesia said, "Let's you know, let's take it one step further and make sure our patients are warm and do not get cold in the operating room." So these were the four things, and you can see that there are some things from surgery. There's some things from pharmacy. There's some things from the nurses in the operating room. There's some things from anesthesia. So it was all around um, what they did. <clears throat> so if I cut to the chase, the the surgical site infection rate went from 27 to 17. So they went to average. 
a 37% decrease in six months. The improvements were sustained at over a year. So they sustained that and they actually got slightly better. Uh, they were never one of the green hospitals down here that were way, way really good, but they got back down to within normal limits. Uh, and what was important is that also, because readmissions, we get, we get um, uh, incentivized to do really well on, re on readmissions. Um, because it's one of the performance measures in the, in the states, it, it also decreased. We know that in surgery, if you decrease your complications, your readmissions will usually go down because one of the biggest reasons for readmissions in surgery are complications. And so they, without even trying, they decrease their infection rates and they also decrease their readmission rates. So it was, we were lucky at the American College of Surgeons to follow this hospital from the beginning to the end um, and it, again, this is a very well-known, famous, famous, famous hospital. Um, uh, and one of the other things that we saw was this, was that at the very beginning, when we measured their communication and teamwork with a survey called the SAQ, the Safety Attitudes Questionnaire, uh, and that measures a, a place's culture and their belief in their safety culture, they were one of the worst places in the hospital. After six months, they were you know, and still, they got better, but they were still below average. After two years, they were one of the best hospital, play, best places in the hospital. This taught us that the, the link between improvement and achievement and process improvement and culture. They couldn't have done one without the other. And as soon, and they built uh, momentum. As they started trying these things, as they started getting these early wins, like they would do something and they would win and celebrate it. They would do something and they would win and celebrate it. As they did these, they got stronger and stronger. They felt better. And they started to believe that what they were doing was really important. And they became one of the best uh, units in the hospital. And it was also infectious. They, they, you know, that pocket of the people taking care of the colon patients were getting recognized and they were happier. They were, you know, they felt uh, more satisfaction with their job and what they were doing. They really felt that they were doing something to help their patients. The, 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 the pockets or the culture, the silos uh, around them recognized it. The, the urologist recognized it. The, um, the, the liver surgeons, the hepatobiliary surgeons recognized like What's happening with those, colon, those people working in the colon patients? Why do they seem so happy? How do they get, you know, why are they getting recognized over and over again? How are they doing this? We, we want to have that. So they actually stole the coach from the colon surgeons to have them help them um, with doing this, this same process. So doing good work is infectious. If you ask the team, that team, remember I showed you their pictures, as well as the staff, um, what they thought were the important things. So team-based approach with each having a key role is really important. It's not a top-down thing. It's not the leadership of the hospital saying, do this and do it this way. It's not even the, it's not the surgeons. It's not the, you know, the head surgeon saying, do it my way. It's really getting the involvement of, of everyone. Empowering the frontline people to provide and test the solutions. So, you know, some folks, there's this, there's, it's almost a, it's a, it's a slightly funny story that, that one of the people in the operating room uh, the, the, this lady who mops the floors of the 18 ORs uh, asked them one day, uh, you know, you change, you clean the rooms after each case, you change all this stuff, and yet when I mop the floors, I mop the floor with my one mop. So I mop this dirty room, and then I go to this next room, and I mop it with that same mop, and then I do all 18 rooms with the same mop. The very next week, she had 18 mops. So it's like it's this this it's the frontline people listening to them and also allowing them to kind of make some changes. The biggest difference, however, for this team and for the staff versus the past was that everyone participated in the process. They felt valued and they believed they were helping their patient. There was dedication, there was engagement, and there was that teamwork and collaboration. Now this project took two years overall. They started seeing results at six months, but this is not the type of thing where you think it's going to happen overnight in one week or two weeks or, or you know, that. It, it is a journey. <clears throat> when you think about teams, so this is a, uh, this is some, a, 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 a description of teams. When you think about a team, there's a lot of different ways to think about teams, but this is a really interesting way to think about it, and, and I think that this this is true as we go on that journey 
of standardization and innovation and standardization and innovation. So if you think about people on the team and you think about it in terms of not just what their training is, surgeon, anesthesia, nursing, pharmacy, or whatnot, but what, how they think. This is a very important part because you need to have a team of these different types of personalities. So you have green people on the team. Green people create things. They do new things. They think of things. They're visionaries. They're not visionaries in like being great, but they just think of new things. They're thinking of ideas. And they're very important to have because they're the ones who are, you know, quote unquote, people hate hearing this, but they think out of the box. That's the good thing about them. The bad thing about them is that they think out of the box so much that if you funded everything they did, you would go broke. So you can't have all green people, but you need to have some green people. To help keep the green people under control are the red people. The red people are usually the people in quality improvement. They like to, or process improvement. They like to do things right. They protocolize everything. They have to do things in a very set, standardized way. They are just like, this is, we're staying in the box. We are kind of doing it this way and we're gonna do it that way every single time. They're, they would build great Toyota cars. So that's the red people. <clears throat> The yellow people are the ones who collaborate. They, they will say that, all right, we have this new idea. We have to do it this way. Let's get all the people in the tent. Let's get the anesthesiologists here, and let's get the surgeons here, and let's get the nurses here, and let's get occupational therapy, and let's get somebody from. They're the ones who are going to bring the whole team together because they want to be much more inclusive than exclusive. And then there's the blue people. The blue people are the ones who are kind of like the accountants. Uh, the suits. They're the ones who are like, all right, we got to do this. We, whatever you do, fine, get all the people in, do what it process, stay in the box, stay in the box. Let's just do it. We got to finish it. They're in the U.S., we, 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 they're the investment bankers. They want to do it because they're going to get the greatest money in their pockets for doing it. It's not always money, but some, some reward. <clears throat> so this is the team, and the key about this, the vision, the goals, the processes, and the values, uh, is that you need all these people on the team, and they have to be talking to each other. So in addition to having the different specialties, you need to have these different personality types, and these different personality types take lead at different times of those cycles. So you can imagine that in a typical cycle, you have the green people who think something new. So let's say the infection rate is too high. What are we going to do? So you have your green people, whether the nurses or anesthesia, or think up ideas, think up ideas. And then once we do those ideas, like how do we get them into play? How do we get things moving? Let's start, let's start get these things going. And then let's invite all the people who need to be here to get this thing going. And then let's standardize these things. And so that cycle goes through, and then you standardize. And so that's from the, from the couple graphs ago. That was that line across when they standardized. But then at some point, because no standardization is ever going to be the answer, that you look at it again, and then your, your, your results start to fall, or it's not exactly right. So you need those green people again to think about new things. How do we tweak this to make it even better? And then you kind of go through that cycle again. And so thinking about it that way is that you have different people on the team or different functions of the team, it, not just by our disciplines and not just by our clinical specialties, but different parts of the project. <clears throat> so the Beatles. Um, so since there's probably, I don't know if there's any millennial generation in here, you all probably know about the Beatles. They're a uh, British band. Sometimes when I talk to the medical students, they're like, who? Um, uh, so they were from the, they had a relatively short, you know, band life, <clears throat> if you think about the Rolling Stones who are what, they're in their 70s now? Um, but here, um, 10 years, they had the most number one hits, uh, uh, a lot of awards, a lot of albums, a lot of songs, and it, this actually made me think about it because I walked over to the museum earlier and on the fourth floor um, there's a picture of the Beatles when they visited um, New Zealand, so I just put that in there. Uh, but the Beatles, um, interestingly, if I can get this slide forward, uh, here. This is a graph, it's a kind of a cool graph. It shows all the Beatles songs uh, and their collaboration on them. So we know, if you know, the, do you know the Beatles, John, Paul, George, and Ringo? So most of them were by uh, John Lennon and, and Paul, Paul McCartney, <laughs> right? So Paul is, you can't read this, but Paul is yellow and John is blue. So you can see most of these things were uh, John and Paul writing. Um, Ringo is green, or no, no, 
George Harrison is green, and so there's a few in there. Ringo's purple, you don't hardly see anything. And then to other people joining in is, is some other color. But if you look at the beginning of, their, of the Beatles' time together, in the, in the early 60s, 62, 63, 64, um, they had very, some very, very famous songs, Love Me Do, She Loves You, Can't Buy Me Love. And if you look at the count the songs just by the number of collaboration of teamwork there, 68%. Over two-thirds of the songs they did, they, they worked together. They collaborated. And if you read the stories, it was interesting because they had very different personalities. Paul was always happy, and John was always you know, not so happy. And, and together, that conflict, that, that uh, difference made for a lot of great songs. At least that's what they said. Uh, kind of the mid-years in 65, 66, 67, you can, ima- you can see that there's less collaboration. Oh, this red dot, these red dots here, are, or these red lines are showing the amount of collaboration. You can see these mid-years, there's still collaboration, but there's less. Uh, and here they're starting with a, a lot, you know, still some very famous songs, uh, but there's less collaboration. If you look towards their last years at 69, 70, um, there's hardly any collaboration. And some of their most famous songs, and you can't read those here, are written by one person. Let It Be by Paul. If you hear that story that he basically recorded the whole thing by himself in the studio and then the other people came in and did what they want, but they were not in the studio at the same time. Uh, Here Comes the Sun, George wrote that by himself. Come Together is John. Uh, this is not that great of a song, but the only thing that Ringo ever did. And, and, so, and so they started, they, rec- they just started doing it by themselves. And, and if you read about the Beatles at that time, it wasn't fun anymore. They didn't enjoy being the band. They, they, couldn't, they, didn't, they hardly talked to each other. You know, everyone blames Yoko, but I think even without Yoko, it would have still been just they got this way and they didn't work together. They lost that spirit. They lost that fun of doing things. And the songs, so 8% of the songs in these last years that were less than 1 in 10 were written together. And the songs that they wrote together were these. Um, I, I've heard of one of them. I've heard of Birthday, but I don't know of any of these others. So it's not like they even did that. You know, these weren't some of their best songs doing that. There's a quote here that the seeds of our undoing are sown at the pinnacle or a success. So a lot of times when we think that we've made it, um, we, we, it's a journey. It's not a destination. And so getting back with that green person when, when after we've standardized is the, is the key thing. That's what the Beatles didn't do, and they, maybe that's that they chose not to do. But, but the seeds of our undoing are sown at the pinnacle of our success, and that's this thing here. Briefings. So the rest, I think, of this meeting is going to be talking about briefings. And briefings, um, I had just had this slide from years ago, and I thought I'd just share it with you because as a foreshadowing of, of what you know other folks are going to say. But map out. It really helps to map out a plan of care. When we talk about teamwork and communication, briefings is like one of the key parts to it uh, in the operating room. Uh, identifies roles and responsibilities for each team member. It heightens awareness of the situation, allows teams to think about the unexpected. I know that you know if I have to operate on a redo, redo pelvis for rectal, or redo rectal cancer, and, and there's these big veins that I don't even know the names of, but I know they're there, and I'll just say, you know what, we might get into some bad bleeding. Have the prolines ready. I need sponge sticks, and and where are the vascular surgeons? Are they anywhere near the hospital? And so you know things like that. And then team members' needs and expectations are met. That. I shared what I needed to share, nursing shared what they needed to share, anesthesia shared what hopefully they needed to share, and all of that. <clears throat> we keep on hearing this, and I think this is true. Even if you increase your communication fourfold of what you're doing, this is in the operating room, this is when I'm talking to you know, students or the trainees, uh, even if you increase it fourfold, you're probably still not communicating enough. So communication is key, and, and we don't do it enough. And even if we think we increase it, we're probably still not doing it enough. And then when we're communicating, this is, I think, my last slide, um, it's really important to be positive, that, uh, that uh, there's so many studies that have shown that the more positive somebody is without being fake, uh, but being more positive. And if you look at the ratio of positive to negative things that we say in our teams, in our relationships, in our, in our teachings, in our, just in our d- everyday discussions, and trying to move forward with our teams, the ratio that we need to get to for positive to negative things is six to one. When we first heard this, um, we did this at work, um, and 
I'm like, that's baloney. And then so we saw all the all the data. I'm like, oh, I guess, okay, I, I kind of believe it. And then when we act on it, it you know, it's much nicer. It, it works better. Uh, but saying six things to one negative thing is not so easy. It's easy to go one-to-one. You know, I like your shirt. Your shoes are ugly. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, but six to one is not so easy, but it's something with practice that gets there and it, it keeps positivity and it keeps the team working and it works much better, that type of communication. In any case, I'm going to end here and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or we could do it later on in the day. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. It's really great to be here. And in, in this type of setting, this is the perfect setting uh, where we can have hopefully some great conversation the rest of the day. So thank you very much. think of them now it's an easy environment to ask a question and um, where all questions will be taken in a completely non pejorative way so uh, this challenge we have which Clifford has outlined to us relates to the balance between standardization and and individuality and and I guess just trying to tease that out a little bit more what say there's there's no ev you know how do we deal with no evidence I'll give you an example <coughs> There's evidence for alcoholic chlorhexidine in terms of reducing the incidence of wound infection, but there's no evidence that the colour we put in it makes any difference. So we're two surgeons in a hospital. I like the deep red colour. You like the pale pink colour, and we insist on being different. Is that a problem? Is that a bad thing? Or is it absolutely fine to have that sort of variation? Or would that sort of variation in <coughs> itself be an enemy of quality? Yeah, so that that's a hard question. <laughs> well, I, could, I, I wish you could ask them. Ask ask them. <laughs> them. So I have to ask you hard questions. So the hard the the answer to that question is that like all things, it depends. It depends on the culture of the place. It depends on the reliability of the place. I I and the philosophy. You know, a lot of times we have to go based on our philosophy, our mission, our values, what we believe in. I believe in more standardization and decreasing errors and decreasing the chance for safety problems than a little personal individuality. So if it's and so but all these things have to be weighed. If the pink and the red one are basically the same, but I just some surgeons like pink and some surgeons like red, versus just having chaos because of just all that individuality and remembering, oh, which surgeon is this? Which one do we get out? And they're perseverating on that more so than figuring out, oh, is this the right patient, the right site, and the right, you know, whatever. Um, I would err on the side of being more safe than, than, than individuality. Now, there are times clearly when th those things are different and, you know, this, and there are reasons to do that. But that, that stuff has to be weighed and, and looked at as a team. And, you know, those surgeons uh, dare say that, you know, if, if they understand that they're the same and they just like them just because their red matches their car or whatever, um, then, then they should be, you know, big enough to say, all right, we're, we'll try it. Everyone uses pink for the next month and let's see what happens. Thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Perhaps while you're thinking one, I'll, I'll tell you, you use the word... This is, this is a long uh, all-black education. You use the word journey a lot, and I hear that a lot in, uh, in, uh, in sort of management meetings about we're on a journey. And for those of us that have got any interest in, in rugby, the word journey is burned in our memories because we talked a while ago about in the mid-'90s we lost an important rugby match and then we were going to win the next World Cup, and the coach was John Mitchell, and he spent the entire time talking about how this was a journey for the All Blacks. It didn't matter that they lost a few games because we we're on a journey. And when we got to the big time, we lost that as well. And so all of us have focused on, if anyone uses the word, we're on a journey, or well, we have to be very <laughs> cautious about that environment because we might lose the big game. Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, I just have a question about the, the, the data. So, oh, thank you. Um, how do we pull out the data that we need to sort of feed to our frontline people? And do you have any recommendations on what a really good platform for that is? Because I don't know whether people have that data in. Yeah, so great question. The, the data, uh, the data are, are so important. And a lot of times it, it depends on obviously what you're studying. 
and uh, and it's really important that there's buy-in and acceptance of the data that's being used. So uh, when we visit hospitals, a lot of times um, the team that gets together, so like for example, that team of the, the the faces on the on that slide, uh, they help decide what what are the data that they can get, uh, and and what's going to help be actionable. And if they, you know, if they, if somebody, for example, if the surgeon says, all right, we're going to use this data, and then the anesthesia says, I don't believe that data. And so that's, that's a non-win right there. But if that team together decides, all right, we're all going to, we all think that this data, you know, whatever data source and the data points are, are good, and they all agree to that, that's one of the important things that the team will do at the beginning, is, is figuring out what data, what's going to be um, believable, and what data pieces, what variables are needed. So the the team helps decide that. All right. Another question here. Yeah. So the question is: is if we go to surgeon level? So in the states, we are um, being uh, incentivized or penalized at the individual provider level. So that goes down to the provider level. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good when you're doing the quality improvement piece. And I would say that in the beginning, not good. Even if you have it, yeah. at least in the in the in in a public setting, you know if if you know if the if the of the head of surgery talks to one of the surgeons says look your rates are getting a little high we got to do something about this and keeps it as that that's I think okay but definitely not you know on a poster board that says you know the different surgeons. All right. Well, I think we'll move on. Thank you Great. very much. Thank Robert. you.